Okay, so welcome everyone uh, to COVID-19, Businesses and the Global Economy. My name is Dina Metter, and I'm the Associate Director at The Wondry, which is Vanderbilt University's Innovation Center. Um, today, we're going to be talking about innovation and an experience-centric future. Um, before we get started and we introduce our expert guest, I want to go over a couple of guidelines to make today's session run effectively. So we definitely want to hear your thoughts and questions during the presentation. We want this to be really interactive. We're going to do this in two different ways. Um, so one way is that you're welcome to tap the raise your hand button when you have a question or a thought that you want to contribute. Uh, we'll stop the speakers and then we'll ask you to unmute and you can ask your question and then go back on mute. The other thing that you can do is you can type your question in the chat box and then either Michael or myself will stop the speaker and we'll ask the question for you. Um, you're welcome to have your camera on during this session. I know it helps me um, to feel like there's an audience out there and you're talking to someone when I see faces. Um, but at the same time, if you are going to the restroom, or you happen to not be wearing pants, then maybe not leave the camera on. Um, so we want you to feel really, really welcome during this session and empowered to ask any questions that you have while we have this expert on. Um, so without any further delay, I want to introduce you to our host and one of our speakers, Amr El Hussini. He's a great friend and mentor of mine who's been a tremendous asset to the Wondery since we first opened in 2016. So Amr, if you want to take it away. Thank you, Dina. Thank you, everyone, for joining again. Welcome, everyone. Um, I am very excited today. This is unfortunately our fifth and last session, but it's, um, it's a very, very important session. And... Um, it's going to cover, I would say, the last piece of the puzzle that we've been building towards uh, for weeks now. This is our fifth. Uh, we started in, uh, in March, and what we tried to do over the past probably month and a half is uh, to try to understand, unpack what's going on in the world, unpack uh, the challenges, unpack the risk, unpack the uncertainty, try to understand what it means for businesses, what it means for economies, what it means for people, investors, all different sides of the, um, of the uh, global supply chain. Uh, we try to also understand what are the scenarios potentially for recovery, um, try to track down how industries are performing or being hit. Um, and then we started exploring really what would that change mean? Is it a permanent change? Is it a long lasting? Is it um, a, a change that will end up with recovery or for, for some other industries, is it a change that's not reversible, unfortunately? We're starting to see some of these uh, playing out, some of these activities. Um, I, will, I will go into our weekly update, but I want to tell you how we got here, basically. Um, we started, we started like after we looked into the different industries, we started looking at what is going on in behavioral change? We talked in the first and the second session, we focused a lot on how important perception is and how important um, confidence is and how important consumer spending ultimately is on the demand side of the curve and how would that apply to the supply, to the economic output globally. So we started with that and we explored it very much in line with digitization. How is behavioral change and the digitization starting to influence or catalyze change in industries? We then dove into what's the state of technology today? What technological enablement do we have? But really when you look at it, technology in a lot of aspects is becoming like a commodity. So it is available to a lot of people, and it's the same type of availability, um, broadly speaking. The biggest differentiation is going to come with how this is explored and the adoption and the perception, which comes from one specific thing, which is experience. Um, if I start by like challenging it from the, from the other side, I would tell you what's your least favorite company to work with? I think I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna throw out a name and tell you why, uh, but I think being in Nashville and we have people from all over the country, all over the world uh, joining, you have personal experiences in whatever market you're in. 
And if you, if you take a minute and think about it, you're gonna find that experience is at the core of your perception of a company. Why do you work with them? And if you notice also, sometimes you pay a little more to get a better experience. You talk to a lot of people and they tell you, we pay for experience, we don't pay for a product per se itself. We pay for the connectivity of the product, we pay for the ease of use, um, for the support around it. And all of these are experiences designed around um, a certain offering. Now, um, I promise to say what's my least favorite um, company, um, it's Comcast. And um, if anybody doesn't agree, I'd love um, for um, a comment or uh, somebody to talk to me about why not and convince me that it's a great company. But every piece of the experience, they have excellent technology, but their experience is always miserable in the sense of it's designed to keep you, like to make it hard for you to get through and get things um, to work. And if you think about fabulous experiences um, that you have, you're gonna think of many, but you're going to probably think of Amazon among the top 10. And Amazon made it super easy for somebody. Yes, they have fabulous um, technology. Yes, they figured out supply chain management uh, and logistics like nobody else, but also they've offered you a screen that is so easy to check anything you want, couple of clicks, one click sometimes just to buy and for something to be on the way being sent to you. So um, we'll get into a lot more detail on that. Satyam is uh, joining me today. I'm so happy for him to be joining me. He's a great friend of mine. He's a leading uh, global expert in that space. He's a thought leader in the space and he has worked with countless companies, leading technology and other companies around the world um, on this um, on this aspect um, I will I will introduce Satyam in a minute uh, just wanted to, to, to like get to the topic of what do you value the most and I think the reason why we are here today talking about experience in our last session is the fact that I would argue that experience is at the top of that list what do you value the most when you're buying or when you're spending um, and this is something that is very key today because so many industries so many infrastructures are changing at the moment and it's going to go down of how do we design or redesign the experience of our consumer or, or our customer to make it the most attractive and sometimes how do we stay alive by using that downtime to improve what we have that not, doesn't apply, by the way, only to companies. It applies to government. We spoke last week and the week before about how bad the experience of going through the um, stimulus package and the applications has been, and how backwards the technology that they had in place were, and how difficult it wasn't the technology itself that was the problem. It was the ability of connecting that technology into uh, people and the front line that is offering the final experience to somebody that has been the most difficult. Uh, we talked about that. We talked about um, multiple other industries before on the digital transformation aspect. So that's that's why we are here today. Um, I will just give a quick update since last week. Um, everyone probably has seen we have 26 um, unemployment, 26 million unemployment claims. Uh, in the past five weeks, an additional 4.4, 4.5 came in, in in the last week. We're starting to see some bankruptcies in sectors that are airlines, that are retail. I'm, I'm putting out names like Virgin uh, Australia and Neiman Marcus, but everybody in the space, Boeing, Airbus, airlines, although they're getting uh, support, they got some of the funding and the bailout uh, uh, funding. I'm talking about globally and I'm talking about how long could they sustain? Um, airlines have already said this will take them probably through to June, but when will that recover? When will everything start to recover? And how deep are the pockets of governments to keep spending money? We talked about that. And this is building a lot of tension, if anyone is watching the news, between 
um, two groups. A group saying uh, saving lives is a priority, and another group saying, well, saving the economy is equally a priority. And the big debate is, there's no clear answer for that. The debate is the following. Saving the economy is very important, great. What if we have a second wave that is more like much harsher on the economy than the first one? Can we go and do the same? On the other side, saving lives is important, but also there's a realization that the government cannot keep doing that. And this is something we highlighted in the first time, like in our first session, we said, Post-2008, a lot of governments have um, used a lot of their tools to regenerate or re-energize some of the economies. They, they used the interest rate, they used the um, printing cash, they used the issuing debt, they used a lot of these tax, taxes. So a lot of these have been used tools. It's very hard to continue to tap into the same resource when it's not unlimited. Um, we talked about hyperinflation as some of the risks. A lot of that is, are things that we cover. Today, I think it's building up to what do we do? Do we save lives or do we save the economy? And this is, there's no clear cut answer. If you ask me, I would tell you human lives are not replaceable ever and the economy can always be replaced. Uh, but I don't want to make the conversation today. I'm highlighting the challenge of decision making and of leadership through this time, and how it's coming down to individual cities and individual companies in some cases to make decisions. I know we have a lot of business leaders on that call, and I would always encourage everyone to take responsibility during times like that, to, to come down to the right final decision on, do I want to put my people that I am responsible for out there during a time like that? Um, the global economic easing, we saw, we saw a lot more, like the US government announced close to $500 billion, 480 specifically additional spending because um, the early one focused on small businesses and healthcare. Uh, the early package that was launched was depleted very quickly and, uh, and that forced them uh, to do that. Um, in our second um, session, we talked specifically about that. This is not a stimulus package. This is more a um, easing package for damaged businesses or damaged parts of the economy, the people that are damaged, um, unemployed, etc. And this is what it's proving to be. It's not creating any growth. It's actually going to replace some of the gap that was created um, on the economic output. Um, since last week, stock markets continue to go up. I said last week, it doesn't make any sense. I, I said last week that um, a lot of those decisions are made by robots and robots don't really know what they're doing when it comes to um, like something that they haven't seen before. It's a lot of um, um, decisions being made by um, algorithms that have learned from previous experiences. And this is something that is happening for the first time. So. No justification, I can't tell you why, but I can tell you it doesn't make sense. That's if you're wondering. Um, I think the key question we come back to every week is what's next? Um, what's next is going to depend on how long this lasts and um, the response that comes with it. Um, but, but what's next, for sure now we know that there are major transformations in, in a number of industries. Um, the biggest ones that I can highlight Healthcare, uh, we've seen the highest adoption rate of telehealth uh, since it's ever existed. Uh, yes, it went through the regulatory um, phase of like getting regulations adapted and then um, customer adoption. I think the biggest trigger of that, were, like, of that pandemic was the customer adoption. And even more, it was the provider willingness to try it and to adopt it as a main source of offering healthcare. The biggest bottleneck in that, I don't think we're consumers or governments, it was doctors and practitioners themselves because they were, it was a new technology, it was not really um, uh, very familiar and it was, we don't really have the time to go through that change and unknown while everybody else is doing um, 
what they've done forever. So who's, who's going to jump first? This came and became a, an immediate catalyst for adoption. And I would argue that I don't think we're going to go back to where we were after this is over. I'm, I'm hearing from a lot of doctors and nurses and practitioners saying, you know what? It's working even better. We're more efficient. We're doing more. Uh, we're probably not going to go back. Now, what does that mean? And what does that mean from a, are we ready? I don't think we're ready. I think we need to adapt. We need to transform. We need to, um, to, 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 to change the way this is uh, working. And this is where our topic of today, experience design, is at the core and super important to address. Um, what about office space? Um, I just want you to remember something before I continue. And this is, I wrote it at the bottom, but it's really for every, everything. I am not talking about when we say new norms and transformation and disruption, nothing changes 100% overnight. All it takes is a one or two or 3% of the user base or consumer base to change their opinions and the, their behavior for that to create um, the momentum necessary. And I gave, I gave um, in that sentence, Airbnb and Uber. Airbnb, they completely changed the industry. They shook all the hotel chains. Um, they created consolidation in the market. Um, Marriott acquired so many other smaller brands, including the Sheraton, et cetera, et cetera, all driven by the, by the impact of what Airbnb did. Airbnb has 4 or 5% market share. It's nothing if you think about it, but it has transformed the world. So it, all it takes when I say change, all it takes is for a controlling minority or a strong minority, I called it the critical minority, to adopt a change. And that critical minority in healthcare has happened. We're seeing it. It's already there. I don't think it might go back to where it was. I doubt it would. What about the office space? We're talking about trillions of square feet of office space around the world. And companies now thinking, you know what? If I had a thousand people coming to the office, maybe I need 500 or 600 or even 800. But 800 means 20% of space will become available. That is by its own enough to completely shake industries and transform the way they operate. Um, same thing is with education. Maybe education will not, you, you'll, you'll find people that will argue on both sides and people that will tell you you can never replace uh, the, physical, uh, the physical connectivity within education and what comes with it on the emotional and social uh, building, social learning. But also, all we're talking about is for a minority, a critical minority, to, to decide to move into more technology-driven education. And we're going to start seeing questions like, would you like to have a diverse class from like 40 countries that you're learning in school with? Um, or you'd like to go to your local school and see people from your neighborhood. 40 people from your neighborhood that all speak and look and behave the same way. How do we, how do we weigh the benefits between the two? I don't know the answer, but those are things that we're going to start seeing, I think, as we move forward. Um, retail, has it been transformed forever? We're already seeing the big names suffering. They've been suffering for a while, but something like that will come and like break that cycle. We, we've seen uh, Neiman Marcus, we've seen um, Macy's and we've seen Nordstrom and we've seen so many others that that are uh, already reconsidering what do we do um, in that space. Consumer behavior and spending patterns have definitely changed. That starts from the personal finances on how willing people are to spend and uh, given the challenges and given the uncertainty about the future but it's also how do we go to restaurants? How do we spend our salaries? What are the priorities? All of that has changed. Um, do we really um, want to explore changes in those industries while looking at technology 
VR is making strides in bringing some of these experiences to people. I want to specifically ask Satyam when we start, how does that change? Like if you want to travel to five countries, you have two options. You get on a plane, you go through the whole um, process, you spend thousands of dollars, or you, you just put in a VR uh, device and you go through the same experience. How does it affect? We know that the feel and the senses are an important part of every experience. But as we develop technology, there are uh, alternatives to provide um, to either an alternative or something um, to complement that experience. This is something I think to put definitely on hold. It's the first thing as a question to jump into. Um, Satyam, would you like to say a couple of words on that or we we go to introduction and then uh, and then no, address no, it. No, absolutely i think there's a there's a whole disruption of experience that's happening on ar and vr so what's going on in the context of covid-19 is a lot of people have to figure out things by themselves the ac is broken they have to figure it out themselves right now what's interesting is a lot of companies are saying can we actually in ar and vr so augmented reality can i actually look at my AC while I've had augmented reality layer and troubleshoot it itself uh, and literally see you know, what's going on with my AC, what's going on with my thermostat, things that you typically, typically would have to have a technician come in and look at, right? So the same applies to uh, you know, virtual reality in terms of workouts, right? A lot of people are looking, like suddenly you're looking at workouts uh, being done in a virtual reality space where your body is still getting the same workout and getting the same sense of in a class of a gym. Now the factor is, has a you know, large multinational like a Planet Fitness thought through that, right? They have closed their close, uh, stores and, and we were in a session together, uh, Amar, where somebody just mentioned that they had to close 500 stores. But what if, but the fact is people still want to work out, right? People still want to get a sense of, you know, and again, working out with resistance or your own body weight is like an easiest way of doing it. All you're trying to do is just get your fitness level high. So there's a lot of these variables that haven't been thought through. And again, thought through with the best experience. I mean, like, how do you get a VR set? How do you learn it? How does your mom and pop, your grandma, how do your kids do it? These are all these variables that have to be thought through. That honestly, I think once thought through, you, the real estate cost, as you called out, once that is off, you can come in a very strong price point. You can do it from anywhere in the world. Disruption is like written everywhere around that. Yeah. And um, like, just imagine having all you all you need is like a treadmill and the the device to go and hike. If you're stuck at home, um, you you'll still get pieces of the of the view. You'll get um, the the sounds. You'll get the experience, the full experience potentially, um, without uh, without even moving. So. Um, I'm not saying this is going to be completely changed. I'm saying those are openings for technologies like that and the experiences like that to start going in. Now, go ahead. Think about Peloton, right? And Peloton, I think this is the best time for them to kind of be there, right? I mean, they were already, uh, they were like a high cost brand and everybody like, okay, fine, you're doing online workouts in your bike that's kind of provided. Now suddenly, I mean, if somebody was to create that kind of an instrument, uh, or that kind of a device, I mean, it's, again, can create a good experience around it. You effectively are created a, you know, it, that's, at least if anything, it's a billion dollar product overall, if you look at market cap. There's so much disruption available, and I think it just takes one person to do it and a small segment to do it, but the best part is the whole world is going to do it, because if, prior to this, if you had a gym, you probably get your neighborhood. Now, if you have a device like this or a system like this, the whole world, I mean, you have 7 billion people who are actually a customer uh, prospective customer. <clears throat> Absolutely, and um, another another idea that comes to mind, and then we will dive in. Um, and Dina, uh, since you're on, um, Dina has been working on an amazing technology that offers the, an alternative. It's in the fashion industry, and it offers an alternative for walking into the store and trying everything in person to do it just by letting a computer measure your size and show you how you would look like wearing um, different pieces. That's a new experience. That means when this is um, advanced enough and um, functional, 
you don't even need to walk to any store. You don't need to touch and feel uh, that. All you need to do is to save an hour by walking and spending the time and potentially going through the security or the healthcare hazard by just sitting at home and picking your, uh, your next... Uh, Dina, would you like to say anything on that? Yeah, um, obviously this was an important challenge even before all of this started. So we were seeing super high return rates, um, some issues also with conversion for online sales. We've seen lots of brick and mortar stores that were already closing and already struggling. That's even more so now. And so these advanced technologies, like what I've been working on with um, 3D simulation technology and utilizing machine learning, they're going to be even more important. And that's one of the reasons I'm really excited for today's topic today. But for anyone who'd want to connect on specifically what I've been working on, definitely reach out to me and we can talk more about that. Great. Well, without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce my very good friend and um, classmate, Satyam Kantamneni. He's um, the chief experience officer. I love the name. Um, at um, UX Reactor, he's the managing director as well. UX Reactor is um, a West Coast based, um, it's global, but they're based out of, the, uh, out of California. Um, UX UI design and experience design uh, studio. Uh, they have an academy, they have a lot of exciting parts to the business that are growing um, like nothing else. And um, it's a very exciting time for this space. It's a very nice addition to our conversation, I think, today and where we've led with our uh, focus of the topic. And I'm very, very excited for you to join Satyam. Uh, Satyam, just very quick background, Harvard Business School grad. Um, he, is, um, he worked with leading companies like PayPal and Citrix and, and, and specifically focusing on experience design and user experience. And that concept has evolved over time and Satyam would do a much better job in exploring or telling everyone what does that mean and how that concept changed. Um, I can tell you it's, it's very much more of a science than you would probably realize at the beginning. When you are changing the way people interact with technology, it's not something, it's not a guesswork and it's not an instinct. There's, there's, there's an art connected to it but it's very much driven by numbers and research on, on data points that consumers interact with and touch points that people would like to see in products. Um, Satyam, I'll pass it on to you. I'm very happy for you to be joining and uh, the floor is all yours. Just tell me how to move slides and I would be more than happy to do that. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so. I'll probably start off with a small story, right? And that of what is experience design, how it's evolved and brought come down here. Uh, I started my career studying a uh, profession called human factors engineering. Uh, so basically understands the study of how humans interact with technology. Uh, when I did this a uh, couple of decades back, it was predominantly a defense centric uh, profession. Uh, not again, it was just about when the dot com boom was starting. Uh, and it started out actually, it has roots in the Second World War. When again, when you look at, uh, you know, invention comes out of necessity, uh, where, you know, obviously wars have brought a lot of application and necessity into technology. Uh, they were, you know, you literally had aircrafts being built with, you know, a lot of switches and uh, a lot of different uh, technology that was built into it. And they started seeing a lot of ejections uh, right before, uh, you know, air airplanes, especially fighter pilots. Uh, there was a study and they saw, saw a lot of ejections happening in airplanes right before they entered enemy territory. All right. And then it quickly kind of, why is this become a norm? Is it like we just don't have the right talent or, or, or the right kind of pilots or what was going on? And then they realized that in the, uh, in the fog of war, uh, the arm your weapon switch is right next to your ejection switch and both of them have the same evidence, right? So someone actually created it from an engineering perspective, works perfect, but in the experience design, they put it right next to each other, have the same evidence. So people were thinking that they were arming their weapons, but effectively they were ejecting out of the plane because it was the same thing. 
And, and that is the genesis of experience design. Just because the feature exists doesn't mean that people will be able to use it because you have to think about every nuance of it. And it's kind of become a, a, a must have for any technology as we are starting to kind of see more and more. Uh, in fact, I tell a lot of uh, business leaders that I work with that if you have a feature that people can't find or use, might as well never have built that feature. Uh, with that said, uh, I think it may help if we could go to the next uh, slide, Amar. Is to kind of bring it back to what's happening with COVID-19, right? And, it, and this has been a very interesting shift. It's been a shift that we've been seeing, but has accelerated like multifold over the last uh, few months. Uh, remote working was always there, but remote working in industries that are not supposed to be millennial or not tech centric is kind of become very interesting. Right? Think about it, right? Our gym that we work with uh, basically is doing remote gym classes. Now think about it, physical trainer, remote working, when did that start kind of kind of coming together? You start seeing school teachers who actually teach in the local school teaching remotely, remote working. It's, it's not only remote working for tech workers, remote working is kind of increasing more and more. Teachers have to spend their time you know, figuring out how to kind of structure it, how to kind of communicate, how to kind of grade. Uh, they are asynchronously talking to a group of people that they don't see. There's a whole different set of experiences that have to be thought through. Uh, and coming back to the point of homeschooling, right? Think about it, right? Parents are now a big part of that experience. Previous to this, I mean, the parents would walk to the, their kids to the school or, you know, drop them off to the bus and then walk away. And then, you know, at 3 p.m. or 4 p.m., that's the next interaction with them. Now you have kids who are walking in and saying like, you know, have I done this right? I mean, it's, uh, the fact that kids are walking into a meeting and then talking to you and then kind of reviewing stuff has become a norm now. So again, think about the experience of how do parents interact with the kids because the softwares or whatever they are being used today are ex very much built as a technology. But what is the teacher experience? How do they kind of upload their material? What is the student experience? How do they kind of engage with their, their the experience itself? What is the parent experience, right? These are all these small stuff that has not been thought through, but what's working well is students are still learning. Students are still getting educated. So I think the outcome is happening, but the pain to get to the outcome is kind of still a, a large pain. I mean, for for example, my, my I have a uh, eight-year-old daughter who's going to third grade. Uh, all her classes, social studies, science, math, everything is in a different system. I have to go and look through all that system. There's different testing systems. Literally, she's working through half a dozen uh, different products. Uh, what is again interesting is my eight-year-old is much more, her learning system is much different than I would say my 70-year-old mom. She's getting intimidated by different kind of, you know, when you start having to jump between products. So experiences differ by humans and differ by people. And I think that is the digital reality that's happening. How many more government digital procedures? Yeah, Satyam, sorry, sorry, just one, one quick comment on that because this is very interesting. Um, if everyone remembers in our second or third session, um, I talked about why some industries have not really been disrupted the way others have and why the revolution has not really touched these industries and I gave the example of financial services and I gave the example of healthcare and I said if you are a market research specialist and you're going what's the first thing you look into as like why if you want to answer why financial services hasn't changed the first thing that comes to mind yes we have PayPal yes now we have Venmo and yes this model is changing but really, it's a technology adoption. It's a technology adoption and the perception of somebody making that decision to take the risk of the unknown. Maybe it's zero risk, but for them, it's an unknown risk of putting their money and connecting it to a screen. And who can see that and who can interact with that? And I said also, it's a fact that the majority of the savings is with the, with the older people because they have worked much longer. It's just a natural uh, thing that happened. And because the adoption, as Satyam is just saying, of the older people is on average lower, this has completely put a whole industry globally behind the advancement of other industries 
that have moved much faster because of adoption rate. Satyam, back to you. Just wanted to interject with this comment. No, absolutely. Absolutely. You're only as strong as your weakest link. And unfortunately, I mean, that's what was holding back a lot of the, uh, the rethinking of the systems. One thing I would also call out is just legal, the legal system, right? Courts are kind of closed. Uh, and, uh, but then what's a big trend that's happening that actually we are working with clients on is online dispute resolution. Right? You're looking at arbitration, mediation, small claims. Can they actually be done online? And how do you do that online? Right? I mean, just again, think about it. Zoom is an awesome product, but Zoom does not support multi-room arbitration. Right? What does that mean? It means that you, know, you have people in different rooms and there's an arbitrator that's going between these rooms and talking about, you know, hey, party A and party B, and then something can be shared, some things can't be shared. The physical thing of being, when I mean, you go to a mediation rooms or arbitration room, which actually still is a big part of our legal system, how do you bring that online, right? But the factor is, it is completely uh, doable online and people are doing it, somehow hacking through it, but the experience is painful. I mean, and that's kind of where the aspect is. If you're looking at innovation in this digital world, you have to think through these. And if you kind of can bridge that experience gap, you effectively have a, you know, a really strong proposition. Now, one big thing, I know we spoke about telemedicine quite a lot, uh, but I'll actually give you a point to think about. If telemedicine actually has now opened up the gate that you can actually talk to a medical provider through a medium like an online or a digital or uh, what uh, FaceTime or whatever the medium is, then why would you only talk to a doctor in California? Why would you only talk to a doctor in Michigan? Why not a doctor in Mexico? Why not a doctor in India? Now suddenly you're talking about healthcare costs kind of come dwindling to a fraction of it, which previously was not, because I think there are still regulatory issues, but why not? You can still talk to a doctor in Brazil and say, and talk to them and say, these are the symptoms I have and not still pay like $200. There's all these business models that actually will come up. And, but the factor is people are doing telemedicine. People are talking to doctors. Yes, there is no, element of physically checking someone but the factor is you know most of the times 90 percent of the diagnostics is history and if that history is put together in a good experience for the physician they can actually diagnose it they can engage with you they can look at you know how way you're going how you're going uh, and there's actually a whole experience around that that have, hasn't been thought through right two more things i'll kind of call out in this uh, uh, grid uh, one is decreased open housing, open houses, right? So real estate, I mean, people still want to sell, people still want to buy. But the factor is, how do you kind of do an open house and such and lockdown, right? Now, what I, this is exactly where a VR system comes in play. Can you actually do a VR? Can you, can you walk around the house multiple times and kind of look at things? And so, but again, think about it. In an open house, you probably are in the house for about 10, 20, 30 minutes. But with a VR system, you can look at that house again and again and again and make your choice with so much detail that was not available before. It has some advantages, has some disadvantages, but the fact is it kind of normalizes. And then connected to that is, you know, closing. Closing a home previous to this, a lot of times, you know, you didn't have, notarization was a very physical process. And now legislations are being passed in a lot of the states where they think digital notary can apply. And therefore, you can actually, you know, verify yourself online and you can digitally sign something online. And now the closing factor where you had to go to someone and kind of do something with a physical uh, closer is actually now kind of going away. You see this digital reality and all this reality is bringing up a lot more to the fore things like who exactly is the experience built to. And it's actually multiple users, multiple systems, multiple contexts. And therefore, experience design becomes so much more critical because you think through each of that detail. Design, the word seems very artsy, but experience, when you think about every user, it's, it's a very scientific process. And I, I hope to share some light on that today as we kind of talk through. So if we can go to the next slide. Uh, we've been hearing the word digital transformation quite a lot. Uh, over the last decade, a lot of companies are moving towards from a physical system to digital. Now, it's imperative for companies to do this to survive. If you do not, I mean, that gym does not have a digital presence, that notary does not have a digital presence, you will not survive. It's just the norm. It's kind of where it's becoming more and more in your face that 
you have to digitally transform, right? And so they, please don't take that away. I mean, you have to still bring more and more things online. The fact that people are standing uh, in a line outside uh, an employment exchange, that doesn't make sense. You don't have to stand in line anymore, whether that means that you need to have a system that kind of allows you to kind of authenticate online, then let's make, that's the system that will come and that will happen. In fact, and a good friend of ours is runs the the, uh, the national identity program for Singapore, uh, and he basically everything you can do online. You just have to, you can authenticate online, and every transaction you can send money to someone online by just having a digital transaction model, uh, digital identity model that kind of is. Now maybe that's kind of where it is, but the fact is digital transformation is an imperative. Uh, that's one takeaway that I want everyone to walk away with. If you're not doing it. Uh, we'll be those dinosaurs that will actually perish fairly fast. If you go to the next slide, uh, so what's going on is because just because you have to be digital, this is what's going on. You just are slapping things online, right? So I'll talk about three different situations that have happened, right? So you actually have tools that are putting a lot of things as uh, feature centric, like I have this feature, I have that feature, but it's very hard to find, very hard to navigate, very hard to understand what's going on. So therefore people don't use it and they, they still go back calling someone, they still go back standing in a line. You have to think about why in this space are still people going to a branch and in a financial uh, setting or if, and, and for a, a doctor consultation. And then you start realizing that there's still some unmet needs that have to be resolved. It's not as easy for people to kind of pay. It's not as easy for them to kind of enter their uh, uh, conditions. It's not easy for them to kind of look at, you know, finding something. And these are all experiential problems. Now, the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the state, uh, this is their unemployment insurance uh, online application. Uh, it looks like it's designed in the 90s, right? And it's kind of very much is true. In fact, they had a big call for COBOL programmers. COBOL, by the way, was something I learned in late 90s as a programming language. Uh, no one uses this today because there's so much more higher end technology, but that's where the technology is. Just because the technology exists or you're digitally kind of can do this doesn't make it an easy experience because you have to rethink through what's the easiest way I can give my citizen the best experience and so on and so forth. And the case in point to that is the healthcare uh, website that came out when Obamacare came out. Uh, this cra site crashed because it wasn't really tested from an experience perspective. People did not know what to do, where to do. Again, you look at that with the whole PPP loan aspect. Experience, if it's not designed and thought through, you can pass a legislation, you know, banks may be running through, but the angst that you're causing your constituents is all going to be eventually what you're going to pay for. Uh, and if your constituents are not getting great experience, they will come back and they'll remember that. Uh, you know, just always factor that in because in the digital world, the change or the choice of moving from one system to another system is a click away. And when you start thinking about that, that much, uh, you know, uh, acceptance to movement, uh, you basically start looking at, you know, you have to kind of get them, you have to engage with them, you have to build the best experience for them. Otherwise, there's someone else who's willing to do that for you. If you are not the best in a fitness coach online, there's someone else will do that. If you're not the best bank online, someone else will do that. And that's the reason why you have to kind of really figure out an experience that's centered around people. But just because you're digital doesn't make you an effective product, but digital is still imperative. If you go to the next uh, slide, uh, Amar. So just wanted to call out, right? So we are seeing this transformation where physical was the thing where everyone wanted to go to the local bank and engage with them. And then suddenly everything was digital. You could send money digital. You can bill pay digital. You can you know, transfer money digital. Uh, you can order checks digital. And now suddenly you're starting to see a huge shift towards experience where I want to do that. I want to do it right. Now, the other thing that's also happening is Remember, we are the generation or the last decade has been a generation of Facebook, you know, Instagram, you know, consumer products that actually have made things easy and, and uh, instant gratification. Now, unfortunately, that also still commutes, right? You don't have people who are like saying that I'm thankful that I actually have still education going on. There are people who are still saying I'm frustrated with how many systems I have to go through because, and that's the thing, people are not looking at it from a perspective that I... I'm glad that things are still you know, running whichever way they're running, but actually you will start seeing a lot more and you're seeing a lot more people publicly talking about 
I wish there was a better educational edu experience. I wish there was a better fitness experience. I wish there was this. And that's the norm. People are still doing what they're doing. People are still, you know, have to en engage and drive things forward. And experience is becoming more and more an imperative. Uh, if you go to the next one, uh, and I keep using the word experience, and I just want to kind of bring it back to what is an experience. It's any event or occurrence that leaves an impression. As a system, if all of us, as we system designers, we think about whatever we are doing, even if a client calls you and says, I want to cut your project because of the economy, that still is an experience. How you treat them, how you kind of make that work is still an experience, but it's an event or an occurrence that leaves an impression. So all of us have to experience design for all constituents around us, and every system that's ever built moving forward has to really think through this. Now, some of the larger tech, tech companies in the Valley have obviously been spending, they have batteries of designers and researchers and experienced designers that actually are spending their time thinking about every small nuance, but then 90% of the world is still doesn't, are completely unaware about the system of kind of how do you think about experience. Just because you have a website doesn't, yes, you're digitally transformed. Just because you have a PPP PDF application that you know, the SPA put out there with a lot of content around it doesn't make it the best experience. You have to really think through that. That is just minimum table stakes. Um, Satya, just one thing on that, which also we covered previously, and this is just a reminder and connection, making the connection. We said experience is not only for users or for customers experience if you see most what most companies are focused on today they're designing experiences for onboarding for their employees or future employees they're designing brand experiences for anybody that they come across even that's not a customer that might be a customer in four years or five years how do they come in with the perception and their willingness to engage with the brand we talked very much in detail about that when we addressed the human capital piece uh, I think in the second or, or third session. And how, how do you design an experience so that your employee is offering the best experience in return to your clients? And how would that value, how, how, how can you maximize that value over that process? And that, uh, so it's, it's not only, I think what, what you're getting to is the experience is anybody, any touch point throughout the whole process that comes in as part of the experience and is a very valuable one piece of it going wrong could impact that whole flow of, um, of, uh, of data and of actually value. Right, in fact, uh, statistically for every bad experience uh, you give in your system, you need to make it up by five good experiences. So that means five good experiences people expected, one bad will completely uh, you know, neg negate that. Uh, and that's the unfortunate model of this, you know, fast clicking thing. If somebody is unhappy, they are five times as, oh, 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 you know, willing to kind of post that online and say, I'm unhappy with X bank or Y bank. But if they were happy about it, only a fifth of them will actually post online. See that you're kind of going against a, a loaded human behavior where, you know, employees, everyone, they are much more open about talking about a bad experience in a lot of different mediums than actually a good experience. Uh, and it's just the nature of how we as humans interact with it. Uh, you may actually have a good you know, uh, feeling about it. You may come back and engage with people and that actually is something, but the fact is you don't talk about it as much. And then and in a world where the world is your uh, you know, canvas, that actually can be detrimental. We can go to the next the one. Contagion, but, the contagion effect of it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And That's I think- Yes, uh, we've seen that a lot with you know Yelp reviews. We have seen that a lot with other aspects where you know one bad review is you know that can completely mess things up uh, overall. And but that's the digital uh, the power of digital overall. So I'll, I'll talk out with uh, I'll start with about uh, four. Uh, I like to call it an experiment. I will share a, a word, and then I want you to think about what comes to your mind as an image. Uh, and when I talk about an MRI experience, getting an MRI, think about what comes to your mind. And then we will talk a little bit more about what does that really mean. Uh, and this is a, a very interesting exercise. Uh, so please play along. Uh, so first one is MRI experience, right? When you think about it, most people think about this, like going through an MRI, you're going through a big system, a big machine, and then you're engaging uh, with uh, 
you know, a lot of doctors and professionals. But if you click to the next one, uh, what, if you click to the next one, um, this is an MRI experience for children, right? Especially children in, uh, in the oncology setting, right? So the highest sedation rates actually happen uh, with uh, kids because they are not, as an adult, they don't follow orders. They are kind of getting taken intimidated. So a really, uh, uh, you know, a smart designer, a gentleman named Doug Deeds uh, from GE uh, Healthcare, went in and kind of thought about what is that experience. He studied the experience of the parent, the doctors, the uh, the uh, patients, or the kids themselves, and said, okay, how do we create an experience around? So in this case, they're actually going through a jungle safari. They're going through that. That's the story that's being told. They actually are engaging on that. Now, immediately brought down sedation rates by a significant fraction, uh, two down to a significant fraction. But the fact was you're designing an experience for the person, for everyone, and this was a big change. Now, again, when you think, I think of MRI versus what actually happened, somebody had to design this experience. Someone had to think through all nuances. And this is a case in point where everything, even a mundane thing like a MRI machine can actually be designed around. Again, it has, an on, it has a lot of, I mean, when you start looking at it, as Amar was kind of alluding to, anytime you design an experience, you think about the journey of every constituent that you're creating an experience for. You create every touch point that they have, all the way from the point that they actually get down in the parking lot. You're starting to think about, how do I tell that story of the jungle safari and get the kid kind of getting excited about it? Now think about every parent who has kind of tried to take the kid to something that they've never really uh, wanted to do, not forget even MRI. You have to think about the experience of like, how do you narrate that to them? And uh, how do you tell a story behind that? And I think that's the same thing that applies very much when you're building even a system like this. If you go to the next one, let's talk about the thermostat installation experience, right? In fact, a lot of times people would not even design or build this. They basically would get someone to come in and do this. But think about this word thermostat and installation experience. And most times this is what comes to your mind, right? You actually have a, you know, a lot of wires, you have a lot of things and you're trying to figure out how to do it. Again, seems intimidating and has these characters that are written up there that you have no idea what G, R, W, or Y are. And it's just, not, it's just for someone else, it's an expert's job. But if you click, Further, you kind of think through how Nest did it. When Nest kind of came up with the, the product, they actually said, we're gonna create an awesome package where you wanna unpack it well. We will show you how we, on an online website, we can tell you which wires are what. We'll tell you how to, we've done a video for it. We have actually created uh, uh, you know, an email which kind of follows up with you. It's an experience that's multi-point, it's a multi-touch point. It's kind of thought through and designed differently. And therefore, now you suddenly have people who have never touched their thermostat, removing the thermostat, installing a new one, right? The one biggest problem for, for building a system, and again, in the case of COVID, what if we actually made things much more self-diagnostic? Uh, if we made things much more, people can figure out themselves that, you know, and they, we can help them and guide them through giving these kits to them. You suddenly are thinking about experiences that are much different than a technician going someplace and then kind of fixing things. Again, experience, when you think through every detail, can actually be done right and effectively can make you, again, a multi-billion dollar product line. Let's go to the next one. Uh, retail banking experience, right? I think this one is going through a significant transformation by itself just through COVID. Uh, but when you think about retail banking, what typically comes to your mind? So now if you can click to the next one, it's typically you're going through a bank, you're standing in a line, you're talking to someone, you're waiting for somebody. But then when you think about how do you kind of rethink this experience in a more effective manner, uh, a really good brand, which actually started online, Capital One was predominantly an online brand that is now going to brick and mortar. And actually, you know, this one would again be right for disruption. They created the concept of Capital One cafes. It's been uh, that concept has been copied a lot more now where it's actually an open space where you sit, you have coffee, you have a barista, you have a, to build this experience, you have to kind of work with space designers, you have to work with suddenly a mixing retail and uh, banking, the banker comes to you, uh, you basically have free Wi-Fi, there's a, a lot more, uh, you know, motivation to bring there, uh, you, to have meetings there. And it's kind of a concept that's now gone through a few cities 
Uh, now again, think about it. Someone has to design this experience and it's kind of, and it, it, suddenly you are kind of talking to clients, you are engaging with folks in a very different manner. Um, Satyam, just a quick um, interjection here. Um, if you guys remember, we talked about something very specific, um, I think two weeks ago. We talked about the example of healthcare and I was saying, who's going to be the next winner in healthcare? Is it going to come from an amazing experienced designer like Google, Apple, Facebook that are going to jump into healthcare and find talented doctors and offer a better experience? Or is it the traditional healthcare providers that are all of a sudden going to realize, oh, well, experience is important, let's go back and do it. I'm willing to bet that it's the, the, the first one. And this is what we're seeing in a lot of cases. I don't think, I think it's much um, easier to crack the let's build the expertise versus let's develop and design the experience for everybody. It might be taking time because they're just thinking about that system. And once you have that system, this is a system that's going to be running for decades. So you need to get it right. And this is probably where um, the, the longer time is coming. But some events like what we're going through are absolutely drastic or bring drastic change or transformation and things like that. Because all of a sudden, you're forced to use the system. You're not even, it's no longer an option because you can't go out. And this is who's offering you the best experience. And that's where some changes that are unforeseen, that's where you see dinosaurs from the past that don't exist anymore. It's something that came that forced the hand of the user to try it. And once they've tried it, they've seen the experience change and they never went back. And I think we're heading towards a similar case with healthcare. I think retail banking is a great example as well. And those are, I keep saying, those are probably the largest two that have not been changed. Absolutely, and, and uh, there's a lot of uh, lot of things that can uh, be disrupted at this point, and, and people are thinking about it. That's kind of the the scary part, because people have time, people have it's been forcing it, and this is truly uh, necessity is the mother of invention, and there's a lot of necessity right now in the market. Absolutely. Uh, and, and, and just also one step, what does it mean? We have such a diverse group of attendees. What does it mean for everybody? What does it mean? I think the way we look at it, or you should look at it is, well, if you're an investor, this is gonna open a whole world of investment opportunities for you. What's the next investment you would want to jump on that's going to be the future? If you are an entrepreneur, well, all of a sudden you have massive markets that you might be able to tap into or also like jump into from something that you've been doing for a while. If you've been in, in whatever, in um, robotics, you might, be, you might find yourself in something completely different. On the engineering side of robotics, you might find yourself actually in healthcare. And if you are in education, you might replicate that experience in financial services and vice versa. This is something that we've seen, the cross-contamination, cross-pollination, of industries is something that happens during such times. If you are um, a business owner, how do you protect yourself and your company and your people, or a, a corporate executive, it's the same. How do you stay relevant in the future? How do you keep yourself and your company and your strategies and your products relevant for the future? And you actually increase your market share once everything uh, recovers. How do you use experiences, uh, not experience, events like that to improve experiences of everybody involved in the process? And how do you come out on the other side as a winner? So I think wherever you are on the spectrum, um, if you're a student, professor, investor, founder, whatever, there's a lot, I think, to learn from that process. Um, and we're leaving it up to everyone to really individualize or tailor the experience to where they come from. But I think that experience still applies to everybody that, that we're trying to cover and go through. Satyam, back to you, sorry. No, uh, absolutely. Uh, it's interesting that, you know, the last time uh, the whole world had so much shared context, uh, I probably would think about it as probably the Second World War. 
where so much innovation happened because everyone is thinking about the same thing. It's not like I'm thinking about my stuff. And especially in this context where with the tools and things available, uh, I would strongly challenge investors and, uh, and entrepreneurs that the world is now a canvas. Everyone is so tightly tied uh, that I think there's a lot that will happen over the next, uh, you know, this is a pivotal moment when obviously you will see a lot of that happening over the next decade. Uh, cool. So moving forward, one aspect that I think is becoming more and more clear, just as I said before, that just because your digital doesn't, you know, it's important to survive, but you will not thrive, right? So you will, people care more about experiences than features. Just because I created an online application, I created an online product, that's not what people really care about. They want an outcome. They want a good experience. They want to walk out saying that, yep, I got my money. I got my thing. I'm I, uh, I, a lot of times people buy a product online. In fact, you know, I used to work for a company called PayPal. And even now people call, they, like I say, hey, hey, why don't you send money through PayPal? If they, you're trying to send it to somebody international, they're like, hey, is that safe? Uh, and <laughs> this world and this generation, safe is such a relative word. But yes, of course, I mean, there's so many more checks and balances. They spend 50% of their money just to keep people safe. And that's why they're thriving but people don't understand that. But now that you have to use it and you want to send money international instead of wiring and going to a bank, you can send money to anybody at PayPal uh, through any bank and on an email. So it's actually very interesting. And I think the factor is people care more about experiences and features. They will pay more, they will engage more, they will uh, you know, talk about it more. It effectively is a critical uh, differentiator. Now talking, from the fact that digital transformation is imperative to survive, experience transformation is imperative to thrive, right? If you're gonna thrive in this market, you're gonna get more market share, you're gonna keep increasing adoption, you're gonna keep, you have to experience, uh, experientially transform. You have to think about how do I do that? How do I engage with that? It's a whole new profession that's kind of come to the fore, uh, especially where you do not have the luxury of sitting down with someone and looking at their body language, engaging with this. Right? We are having such an important conversation on Zoom and the experience that's being brought together through Zoom is actually critical than, you know, versus doing it some other tool. Uh, and it's just the nature of how you have to think through every nuance uh, and, and uh, structure. Uh, moving forward. Before we move on to the next point, can I ask you a quick question? Yes, go ahead. So we've had a question come in about, you know, specifically in banking, but certainly in other industries as well. Um, a lot of that depends on relationships. You build a relationship with a person. That's who you go to when you have questions. How do you see that moving in this world of digitization? Sorry, I... Uh, so the question was, how do you see uh, the relationship-based businesses moving uh, in this world of digitization? Uh, yeah. The answer is, let's put it down in the perspective of your relationship experience. How is that going to take on uh, online, right? There's still so many ways. You can, you can text each other. You can talk to each other. Previous to this, you had to set up an appointment with your relationship manager, meet them. But now you can text them, call them, see if they're, they'll think about the world where, you know, you see they're online or offline. You can actually, uh, you know, there's an element of still having that high touch uh, conversation. There is, but you have to think about that experience differently, right? You could send them like a text and say, hey, can you call me when you are ready? Uh, and these are all these variables. That means I need to know that the other person is available or not available. I need, so there's, there's still things that you have to evolve, but it's doable. Right. The factor is, I mean, we're having high touch relationships with uh, in, in work from home context with Slack or any other tools that have kind of come to the fore now. You can quickly get on a Zoom call with someone and chat about things. But prior to this, you couldn't. You had to go to a bank. You had to talk to a man, man, You had to talk to a relationship, a person, a relationship manager, and then kind of have that conversation. So you have to rethink through that. But the answer is it's equally doable. And we've been doing that from them. I mean, we are a generation of face timers. Right. We are keeping in touch with grandparents and parents and, you know, relatives and friends on FaceTime and have done a reasonable job on that. Now, why not have an equivalent system of that? These are all those variables that I have a thought that, that you have to think through. Yes, there's no exception for when you can have a drink with people. But you know what? I mean, you're starting to see products like uh, 
uh, house party and uh, you're starting to see people with having Zoom ha happy hours. You're starting to see a shift in behavior there. But honestly, what stops a bank from saying, let's do an open house with our bankers and our customers, our top 10 customers, doesn't stop them, right? Again, you have to think through those aspects. Uh, doesn't stop them from doing a webinar and talking about like, hey, how can we help you as a business? There's all these variables that were previously not thought through, but now are coming to the fore. Cool. Uh, moving on, I know I'm just a little uh, conscious of the time. What actually happens in most of the organizations is this, and this is again a little bit to organizational dynamics and design. When everyone says, let's build a great experience, everyone agrees. I've never seen an organization that doesn't agree but they have a very different structure and a format to it. Everyone is like, oh, okay, I agree. And marketing, sales, product, development, exactly the point I said today, like how do you increase a high touch experience? Uh, and suddenly you start realizing that, you know, there's no real structure to it. Therefore, it's not a art. It has to be brought together in a very deliberate manner. So go to the next one, Amar. Now, coming back to the profession itself, right? I just want people to be aware that experience design is a skill by itself. Uh, it takes a village to make this happen, right? So if you actually ever want to get into the journey of, you know, I want to build the best experiences, you really need to think about three major skills. Just like in product development, in most engineering organizations or digitally transformed organizations, they have architects, front-end engineers, JavaScript developers, API developers, data scientists, they just have a lot of different people that are orchestrating that. Just for experience design, you have you know, three to four major skills that come together. The number one skill is user research, where you are constantly starting to understand who are your users, what are they doing, what is their journey, what are their needs. You constantly are trying to map their behavioral dynamics. Uh, you know, how you, you know, if you are a bank, you want to understand what your senior uh, user group is looking at versus your millennial user group versus your small businesses versus your, uh, you know, your consumers. You start looking at nuances of those kinds because you have to build an experience very deliberately for each one of them. And then the experience designer comes to fore. They're thinking about how I take those touch points. How do I do that? How do I engage with that? You know, where am I going to create an online product? Where am I going to create a offline product or an experience or a touch point? And then eventually you're starting to look at in the digital world, visual designers who actually bring the stylistic elements together. It effectively comes together and that's what you're orchestrating whenever you're building any system. Let's talk about if you're looking at, you know, homeschooling as an experience. If, if someone has to think about what is the first time they're learning the experience, that's a UX designer's pain point. They have to think about how are they uploading their curriculum? How are they kind of uploading their tests? How are you proctoring a test, right? So the proctoring experience from a teacher is gonna be equally as important. Uh, and you have to think through that and then look through aspects of these. You still have, and again, has been solved in the, you know, the SATs and the SATs of the world, but you physically have to go to a location. But what now, if you can't go to a location, how do you take that experience forward? This is exactly what, you know, experience design profession starts looking at. Okay, now touching different touch points. Maybe there's a proctor overseeing you and looking at your camera and saying that you are not looking at anything else. And while you're doing the test, there's all these other variables that come into play. And again, where technology meets a use case and then the designers can design a really effective model around that, that's truly where magic will happen and biggest value creation will happen. Well, we have um, another question that's come through if you want to take that real quick. Sure. So, um, so often UI UX is given the least priority in product development. So how do you see business leaders increasing this importance, um, especially in this crisis crunch time, but to ship the product to market? See, I think... I actually feel that most business leaders, unfortunately, don't know the power of uh, user experience, right? And when I say UI, it is the, the UI itself, the, how the, 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 the screen looks and so on. The UX is how you understand the users and then react to two different aspects to it. But most business leaders don't know the power of uh, UX and the way they actually can engage and drive it. And therefore, they always look at it as a good to have. Uh, when you start seeing your occupancy rates for a hotel going down uh, and then you realize that's not it's, it's all about that paint smell so now suddenly a painter job has become so much more critical 
uh, because the smell and the experience that you walk into that is much more important. And that's the same thing that user experience or UI actually has. It's, the, it's not the, just the painting job, you have to think about the whole experience. Uh, and businesses that have obviously gotten and understood that are thriving, are doing well. I'll show you a, a, a graph later on uh, where it talks about you know, how this actually impacts the businesses itself in terms of you know, true comparison to S&P and other models. Uh, but answer is it, the data is so much in your face that you know if you don't do this, first of all you'll not thrive. Second, and you basically are kind of leaving a lot of money on the table because that's what people are judging you by. If, and uh, the difference between going to, especially if you're not going to a physical branch, you know it doesn't matter anymore whether you know the branch is one mile from you or five miles from you or completely doesn't have a physical presence, uh, as long as the experience is the best design and therefore your money will go to that branch. And Satyam, there's, there's something in, in the retail space or the mass market space of measuring the stickiness of, of the, or the average lifetime um, of a user or a customer. This, is, this comes right at the core of it when you're looking at experience and perception of that experience by users. So that's where you ex add so much more value. Sometimes companies, if you're thinking about it from a return on investment, just to sound very simple, um, Example, let's say a lifetime, um, a lifetime return on a user is $5,000 and you're investing $2,000 to acquire that user early on. Um, if you can extend that just by, by, by doubling that from 5,000 to 10,000, you've actually multiplied your return by five times instead of by two and a half times. And um, the ability to, to, to keep that the contagion, the spillover or the contagion effect or the cross uh, pollination effect, which we talked about them, which are different parts of different industries, the way that they spill over to other clients and to other people to convince them to come back, the longer they are and the better, the, the happier they are. And the 20% case you gave uh, Satyam is a very relevant. When you're unhappy about something, you're going to talk about it. When you're happy about something, only a fraction of the time you're going to go talk about it or encourage somebody. Unless you have um, such a great, unique experience, then this becomes an incentive to do that. But that also, if you think about it from the competition and today how much everyone is trying to bite into others' market share and trying to jump into other, like making a shift, not even within the technology space itself, but also within other industries. How do I go and compete? in somebody else's home court and try to get a piece of the game. Um, this is, this is as, as relevant as ever because um, the barrier, how, bar how high the barrier to entry for somebody else for a competitor and how you can push com competitors away um, during times like that is, is, is something that is so relevant and then that we're exploring with companies um, from all sizes, from the early stage all the way to larger companies. Absolutely. I think the return on investment analysis has been done so much. And that, as I said uh, earlier, many business leaders don't understand the true power and therefore they are not able to leverage that. I'll give you one simple story. Uh, in an e-commerce experience, if I can get you to add on an additional item to your cart that you were not planning to, by just showing you, I mean, the recommendation, the engine can work, but where I show you, how I show you, the hierarchy of where I show this to you, can change literally your margins by literally a 10 to 20 percent additional margin that comes into it because you decide which one you if somebody's buying a pencil you want to maybe sell a sharpener with them but how do you show it to them in the right manner and the right structure those subtleties that's why companies like google spend tons of money trying to look whether she's bolded not bolded uh, and so on and so forth and you just start seeing millions of dollars of value kind of changing just by small subtle differences it's such a scientific profession that you know if people think of it more so as a painter as I, as I gave you the analogy before like anybody can paint but the answer is no i mean you effectively have to think about it truly as an experienced designer so i'll quickly show I'll talk about three the three aspects of this right so there's research there's design and there's visual the three major i would say cornerstones uh, one of the three major cornerstones of, of uh, this profession uh, any good uh, experience firm actually will start with research, understanding or understanding the user itself. 
you have different techniques, methods, and so on. This is not the same as market research methods. These are much more fine-tuned, much more evolved. Uh, so think about it that way, right? What is your journey mapping? What, how does the journey of your customer go through your process? Looking at every touch point and seeing how well can you create that experience much more effectively. Uh, testing each of those experiments that you have. The, our professor at HBS has documented and done so much good work on experimentation, has proven the fact that uh, Professor Stephen Tomke, uh, you should look at him and study his models where experimentation and companies that experiment a lot more actually are much more successful over a longer period of time. And in the digital world, you can build a lot of these experiences and test it out in different ways and then kind of say which one works for whom. And you can do this, and that's the other benefit of digital, that the cost of experimentation is very low versus building a physical store and then seeing whether it worked or not. You can try different experiments for different countries, different locations, with different people. There's so much that you can do, but again, knowing who your users are, you can drive that. Go to the next one, Amar. So when you start looking at the touch flows, you have to start thinking about every small nuance of you know how are they touching, what goes on where. You know, this is the element. When the healthcare.gov uh, you know, screens and, and the, the, the system was released, they didn't test it from a user perspective. They didn't even show it to a user and say how they will work through it. They didn't engage with any user and, and, and therefore they effectively had to kind of be brought back a few months in, uh, in terms of the process. But the angst and everyone still talks about it like, yeah, Obamacare was so painful, it was so hard. The, the Obamacare itself wasn't painful, the experience was painful and people still talk about it. And the, someone hadn't thought thought through the paces. Just putting a screen together and putting the technology together doesn't really count. And again, classic case where you know you lost billions of uh, dollars of you know uh, perception and then millions of dollars of obviously through cost. Uh, so a UX designer is actively thinking about every small nuance. And then finally, the visual designer is looking through all the aspects of you know bringing this the style and and, and the structure to this. The very simplistic example of doing this, again, it, it, there's a lot more details that go into this, but anybody who's trying to design their experiences have to think through every small nuance. If you go to the next one. Uh, now the best part is it's a very fun, immersive and collaborative process, right? Whenever you do this, it's a very engaging process. You kind of can, you know, you're talking to people, everyone comes together, engages together. Now the whole disruption that's going on here is uh, we are actively working on tools that can be this can be done online. You don't have to physically come to a space. You know uh, this is again back to 3M, right? They're making post-it notes, but can you make sticky post-it notes and create an app around that, right? Can they? Because post-it notes is a huge part of ideation and structuring and stuff. Now if a 3M brought that out, then they suddenly are looking at all these variables. But there's opportunities that are opening up everywhere, but the whole process of experience design is a very fun process overall. And I think, and when you go through it, you'll start realizing that it not only has a direct effect of building great experiences, but you also start thinking about nuances like, you know, you start being alignment, everyone is kind of has much more empathy to their customer and everyone has a single mission. All these other side effects that come together that actually work together. Uh, this one is, a, is, a, is an example of how you actually think about one user and their whole experience in your system. If you look at an example of a Dropbox or any of these uh, online storage applications, uh, experience designer has created, an, uh, at least in our case, has created a whole journey of how do they learn about this product? How do they install this product? How do they try it? You had to think about every small nuance of their touch point and, and think through that. Like, for example, right now, the biggest pain point I have in uh, education experience of as a parent is I have no single place. I'm looking at the same things that my kid looks at. I'm looking at the same thing that, you know, I, and I'm sure the teachers also don't have a different view to them. They actually have a different perspective. So there's a whole opportunity that you have to think about a teacher's experience different from a parent's experience, different from a, uh, a student's experience versus a student and their peers experience. And when you start orchestrating this very cleanly, you effectively will have a very high touch and high value system. So uh, Last few slides, I probably want to call out this aspect of you need to be driving the right business outcome. And UI UX is not something that you just do just for the reason. You can increase adoption, you can increase retention, you can increase your satisfaction of your users, you can increase the engagement of your users, efficiency of how you're doing things. There's direct correlation to these business needs. 
And, and that's the reason why I say many business leaders don't understand that the skill can impact them because they treat it like a painter. Uh, but the one example that's right here, like if just in terms of a, uh, retention, if you can just increase your retention by 5%, that means you're increasing your profit by 25%. So think about all the experiments you can do digitally by increasing your retention by 5%. And how do you think about that? And there's so many ways you can do that. There's so many techniques that are available out there. There's directly direct correlation to you know, businesses uh, who want to kind of leverage this and drive this uh, just that they have not gotten the right partner or they have not gotten the right experiments running. Uh, but the factor is it's, there's a value sitting on the, and the money on the table all through this process. But the best thing is, think about it. You don't have to worry about just your local area. The whole world opens up when you're doing this and you can design different experience for different people. And then there's a whole multiplier effect that comes in where, like, think of our world of sharing and liking and, and uh, clicking and all to be, like, everything to be driven by those and tailored, tailored uh, content. All of that is driven if you think about it a tiny little thing that nobody would have ever thought about could make a big difference from a 100 views to a million views and and more of that what does that mean what that means in in the sense of uh, commercialization of business impact of financial impact is huge it's very hard to measure it's how it's very easy to measure the 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 direct correlation that Satyam is talking about, but there's a huge under, like, un, like something that nobody is seeing that is correlation and driven by um, that impact that this is creating that nobody's yet talking about, but it's absolutely part of the, um, of the experience. Absolutely. If you go to the next one, Amar. So I, I want people to look at this chart a little cleanly, right? So this was created by uh, the Design Management Institute uh, studying companies between the year 20, uh, 20, uh, 2003 to 2013. Uh, the first and foremost takeaway is companies that actually had a design-centric culture. That means they had researchers, designers, uh, in active experiments going on, beat S&P by 228%, right? That's literally two times what they were doing in the market and much more than two times. Now, what's interesting, we study the graph a little bit more. Look at the time period between uh, December 2007 to December 2008, right? That's when the banking crisis happened. You see a big dip in S&P, but you see a slight dip in the companies that were design centric, right? That's something to kind of take note of. Now, what's also interesting is when the market opened up, there was a big switch for uh, the S&P, but the companies that were design-centric went much higher. Their slope was much stronger, much farther, and so on. So you start noticing these small nuances. The market is, is the data is right there in front of you. When the, the bottom hits, it doesn't hit you as bad. When the peak hits, it gives you a much more value because people are coming back to you much more strongly. And that's exactly what happens. And this is, again, your data sent, data point 12 years back, but that's the same reality. It's actually today even more accelerated because the generation today is much more digitally savvy, much more ex expects things to be much more easier. Uh, you know, and, and, uh, much, and unfortunately, they want more instant gratification than you know, delayed gratification. That is the generation we are talking about. And the behavior changes, they will judge you by that very uh, you know, context. Uh, Simple point is experience design, not UI design. In fact, UI design, the least point of value creation. Experience design is the highest point of value creation. And when you start thinking about companies that really invest in it, uh, you actually del deliver a lot more value. The last thing I'd probably share with you is this clear research uh, that Forrester has done that literally says that for every dollar you invest in UX, it brings you $100 in return. And with a return of literally 9, 9,900%, uh, you effectively, it is not something that is no more uh, you know, uh, good to have. And again, the cost of experimentation of doing best experiences is really low. So uh, it's just understanding of the business leaders that especially given that 90% of the world is still non-tech and they're trying to move to digital transformation, but understanding that just being digitally transformed will not get you the value is a huge shift that needs to be understood. and is kind of completely out there as the right thing to do. 
Any, uh... This is great, Satyam. This is wonderful. Um, this, this, I think this brings, back, brings us back to the conclusion that we started with, which is technology is now a commodity. It's no longer a breakthrough or it's no longer a daily advancement. Everybody has access to roughly the same technology for the majority of consumers around the world. The biggest differentiation is happening with experiences today. And that's why we started last week by talking about, okay, where is technology revolution going? What has happened and what's yet to be um, done? And um, last week we focused, Xiam focused very much on we have a lot of the technologies that we don't yet see in the market, not because the technology is not at par, it's because the legal, the regulatory, um, the product development is not there yet. But we are heading towards a lot of change and the technology is evolving. But what's going to drive that massive transformation over the past 10 years, which we said last week was more than the past 60 years combined um, in terms of changes and influence, it's going to be enabled and catalyzed by experience. And that's why we left this session till the end to be the last piece of the puzzle. Think of it as investors, again, think of it as um, business executives and business owners and any where you are i think this is something to keep in mind and to keep focusing on i'd like to leave um like just a couple of minutes any final questions on this before we wrap up i have um like just a couple of minutes to close where where we have and then just remind everyone what we've done and what was the purpose of of everything so I'd love to throw one out there. So Satyam, you talked about people being five, five times more likely to post about a negative experience. What are some examples of designing that user experience that companies have deployed that you feel like has been more effective at encouraging positive feedback or positive posts? So I think there's a lot of uh, techniques there, right? So one of the techniques that is, is gamifying, right? So and you start noticing that uh, if somebody was to post a good review, that you're willing to give them something and on, on behalf of that, or they're willing to talk about it. Uh, so there is elements of incentivizing. So there's incentivizing techniques. There's also techniques around, right, you know, uh, Airbnb does that consistently, like pass it on to people and then, or not Airbnb, like a lot of our companies have been doing the viral effect to that. Uh, but the factor is making those tools easier, right? So like going and up, up, uh, going to a separate tool and then saying, I'm going to now go into my Facebook and post it versus giving you the link right there with pre-canned pre uh, you know, comment in there that actually allows me to quickly do that. So again, it's all about convenience. The person may have the intent, but they may not have the, the follow through, right? So now as an experienced designer, how can I make that one click away? These are also variables that kind of come into pictures. And then you can design different models of that, right? You can start looking at maybe three different uh, structures that you design and they say how do I kind of get the person to uh, do that now again if someone has a bad experience that's what the challenge is they're highly motivated to go open up that other app take a screenshot put it up there you know take a video etc cetera, etc cetera. but what if they could take a video right there in the uh, in the system itself and they could kind of post it these are all things that you know the factor is feature wise and technology wise yes I mean you can always take a screen capture and send it but then has it been designed that way that you can actually allow that person to do that. There's all these small subtleties that go in. Now, again, every system that you're designing for has to be thought differently, but the answer is yes, you are starting to think about how can I make it easier? How can I make it faster? How do I motivate them? The human behavior, psychology, all those things kind of come into play. I hope that answers your question. It does this. So I haven't seen any questions come in through in the last couple minutes on the chat. Does anyone have anything that you'd like to ask while we have Amr and Satyam on the line? So one thing, right, that I've been thinking about, because I work with a lot of startups, so groups that are really just trying to get something together, they're still doing lots of research. 
maybe talk a little bit about the difference with a startup, you know, getting something out there versus really trying to design that perfect user experience. See, I think there's nothing called perfect, to be honest, right? So the fastest thing is that you have to put it out there. You have to study what the market is telling you, right? So uh, first of all, knowing who your user is, because you still see 30% of the companies failing because of uh, market fit. You still see 50% of the companies shipping a product without talking to even one user. I think that's a strict no. You can be a startup or you can be a you know, large company. If you do not know your user, you don't talk to your user, you don't engage with your user, uh, that is a strict no. You're going to highly fail uh, and, and you don't know what you're dealing with and who you're dealing with. Uh, you may have a lot of preconceived notions, but that's not the same as getting data around them. So I think that said, if you have the data and you have the structure, then you create experiments. The biggest challenge is user, the UI is what you don't have to get perfect, right? You, you have a hunch, you create an experiment, you design a structure, you put it out there, and then you let the users react to it. Then you kind of let that aspect kind of build and you kind of tri triangulate what the users are doing, what they're saying, and, and what they feel. So say, do, and feel as we kind of talk in the research domain. So you kind of connect that dots and then come back and say, is it working well, not working well? Okay, let's keep it iterating and, and, and keep evolving this further. That is what how you build a product in this particular world. Uh, you need to have a gazillion experiments that you're kind of running. You're gonna get it right. Your users will react to it. Uh, and that's what is the, the sense of success. Now, just to get everything perfect and get it right, get it perfect with one user before you get it perfect for the whole group of users, right? So you can still kind of focus a lot more. A uh, lot of companies don't know who the user is and therefore they create a lot of different things and then they actually have a lot of group thing going on uh, and then they actually spend a lot more time, so again, trying to uh, unravel that between a lot of the stakeholders. It just wasted time and opportunity. The simple answer is, uh, you know, people need X. Right now, think about what happened, right? With all the systems that are going on with uh, the post-COVID-19 uh, issues, people have immediately slapped together things and put it out there. It's the best scenario for entrepreneurs. Now they can study these systems that have suddenly emerged and say, where are the pain points? Where are the issues? What's going on? Okay, now I'm going to take it. I'm going to prioritize that. I'm going to solve that because teachers are already using Zoom. Fitness companies are already using Zoom or any other thing. Now, how do I take that uh, change and kind of build on that model and now really deliberately design it is actually what the shift is. But the answer is the cost of experimentation and cost of doing this is literally in days, not even months. So anything else before we do closing remarks and wrap up this uh, series? Nothing on my end. I just would say that, you know, hey, if this is, there's a lot of material out there, people I think should uh, strongly look at, you know, just don't, don't do the mistake. I always say like, people agree that you, you need to be fit. No one knows what the, what the right secret to fitness is that, you know, health, food, you know, diet, sleep, the same as to when you're trying to build a really solid experience and a solid business around digital systems just being digital itself won't make you there. So you have to think through every nuance and for more importantly, think about the users that you're designing it for. So Amr, do you wanna go ahead and start the wrap up? Yes, um, so uh, this is our fifth and final session from uh, this series, everyone. Um, this has been, the, the reason why we did this is we wanted in such a critical time and such time of uncertainty for everybody. We wanted to provide resources for, for anyone within the global community that is seeing events unfold and wondering what's gonna happen, how am I going to be impacted, how is my business going to be impacted, what does it mean for financial markets, for startups, for everybody. We tried to focus early on on establishing a very important fact, which is how much global economies are interconnected, much more than we think. Although we hear people talking about um, um, disconnecting from the world and putting sanctions, all of that is in one place, but the world we realized is super interconnected and is going to continue relying on everyone else either as a marketplace to sell your products or to source some of the talent or so source some of the products that you use or to travel, whatever that is, 
the world is super connected more than any other time. And this is only going to incentivize more connection. So when we think of our actions as business leaders, we need to think of how are we addressing needs and uh, challenges that are across the globe with seven plus billion people instead of within our local economy. The second thing is we try to, to, to unpack what a crisis management system looks like. How do we start approaching the uncertainty and how do we build response mechanisms within our own lives or within our own um, ecosystem or within our own organization? Uh, we highlighted cash management to be emerging as a key area of focus because this is the main survival tool. This is what every company needs to focus on. We're working with a lot of companies on that in the background, but I also hope that you as business leaders or as um, educators or as whatever you are in the spectrum, try to apply some of these concepts um, to what you're doing on a daily basis. Uh, we focused a lot on the startup businesses and the small and medium size because they are going to be activating a lot of the change for the future. They, a lot of these are going to emerge as the biggest winners in the future, but unfortunately they are also facing some of the highest risk. So we looked at that and tried to understand what it means for companies to be in that ecosystem and what are the major opportunities that will come out of this. With all the negativity around that, there's always so much opportunity in business and in investment and in transformation and leadership and uh, technology and whatever that is um, to create change in the world and how to impact the world. We also looked at how behavioral change, this crisis impacted a lot of change in people's behavior and in digital behavior and how would that impact the world and how it's impacting. And we tried to look at some of the previous examples to learn how they could potentially impact the world. We also looked at how enablement in technology, how advancement in technology is going to allow some of the changes to, to, to quicken or to happen at a much quicker pace. And we wrapped up today with the, uh, with the last piece, which is it's not really the technology that is bringing the change. Technology allows the change to happen. What makes the change happen is designing the right experience around it and understanding how it impacts your stakeholders from employees to users to customers to investors to everybody in that in that supply chain we continue to work with great partners like um uh, ux reactor and satyam at, at its helm on on working and figuring out how to problem solve in cases like that we also work with our clients and our portfolio companies on improving during such times and looking at the future with a lot of, um, I think, enthusiasm, because a lot of positive change will still come. This is what we tried to put forward. And I hope everyone learned nearly as much as I did. I learned probably more than anyone else being on that. And it was such a pleasure to be there. Dina, thank you so much for making this also great partnership possible and um, for bringing the platform to offer those uh, those lectures i'm very very happy that we had the chance to do it and i hope we'll be able to come back with more content and more um, uh, material going forward that would adapt to cases as we change this five series was our first it was a great test um, we've had great feedback i would say um, please feel free to keep sending your feedback as we move along uh, we're going to have the recordings, as Dina said, and I'll leave it to her to wrap up. Again, thank you for all our guests from the first session all the way till today, um, ending with uh, Satyam, my great friend, um, who gave an unbelievably interesting uh, perspective. I know a lot from him, and I still learned a lot today. So anyway, Dina, back to you to wrap up, and thank you, everyone, for being there throughout uh, those past few weeks. Yeah, thank you, Amr. Um, you know, without your thought leadership on this topic and moving us into this series, this would not have been possible. So a huge, huge thank you to you and for organizing lots of the fantastic guests that we've had on during this series. And then Satyam, this was an excellent talk today to wrap us up. 
um, on the importance of user experience, which I think was the perfect topic for us to end this series on. Um, you know, we've explored, as Amr mentioned, a number of topics throughout this series, everything from just the economic kind of snapshot week to week to the CARES Act and relief packages to banking and different industries and how they've been affected to today, thinking about user experience. Um, the Wondry and the Lodestone teams, um, we're going to be putting together a highlight reel from this five series talk. So that's something that we'll release on the Wondry's website as well as on social media in the week or so following today's session. And the, as I've mentioned, the Wondry's Vanderbilt Innovation Center, Lodestone Advisory Group's a strategic investment and management consulting firm. Amr and I are both based out of Nashville, Tennessee. And even though this series is ending, you know, we're both still here if you want to connect as we navigate these next phases of the crisis and reopening. Um, the Wonder is going to be hosting a number of virtual events. One of the next ones that will be coming up is going to be a fashion sustainability discussion. So uh, we're nailing down the date, but we'll have that posted on our virtual events page on our website once that gets going. We're also doing a number of short social media interviews with really interesting people all across the country. I have really enjoyed spending this time with you on these Monday sessions. Please stay safe out there, um, be kind to one another, and support the local businesses and the businesses that have been making a difference for everyone during this crisis. Um, thank you so much. It's been my pleasure to have you. Thank you, Dina. And if anyone would love to connect with any of our fabulous guests over the past weeks, please feel free to reach out directly to me and I'll be happy to, to, to connect you directly. Thank you, everyone. And I hope to see you soon in person once this is over. <laughs> awesome. Maybe we do a happy hour online. Yes, definitely. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, everyone. Satyam, thank you so much. Take care. Bye. Thank you.